about. So you open to Daniel chapter 8. Last week we talked about this concept of repeat and enlarge. And chapter 8 follows that same pattern. Remember in Daniel 2, Nebuchadnezzar had this dream, and Daniel interpreted the dream in which he discovered the outline of world empires, Babylon, Medo Persia, followed by Greece, and followed by Rome. Daniel 7 gave this same strategy of Babylon, Medo Persia, Greece, and Rome. And then Daniel 7 added the little horn power, the pagan Rome and the papal Rome. Daniel 8 follows a similar pattern. Now, there's a disadvantage of reading an English Bible. The advantage is that's our language. So, but the disadvantage is we don't see the the underlying word plays that take place. Daniel chapter chapters two through seven are written in Aramaic. And Aramaic is a language of commerce, is a language of diplomacy. It's a language that Jews, even Jesus, use from time to time in Aramaic. Whereas chapter eight through the rest of the book is written in Hebrew. And the reason for this is that the chapters 2 through 7 are written for everybody. Written for the Babylonians, the Persians, written for the Jewish people. But chapters 8 through 12, which is a biblical Hebrew, is specifically speaking to the hearts of the children of Israel. Remember, they're in captivity. Their hearts are broken. Their, their temple is destroyed. They're wondering where God is. They're wondering if there's any hope. And so, the next several chapters, God is speaking to the children of Israel and saying to them, there is hope. Don't give up. Don't think that the enemy has won. In chapter 7, the one word that, that stands out is the word dominion. And in chapter 8, the word that stands out is sanctuary. I, think it's, I really haven't thought much about it, but you know, when you look at the animals in chapter 7, lions, bears, leopards, and non-discreet beasts, did you notice that these are all unclean animals? And it shows in chapter 8 that the ram and the goat are clean animals. They're also sacrificial animals. I told my wife that, and she says, are you saying that Persian and Greece are going to be sacrificed? And I said, no, that's not the point. It's just interesting that, that God chose these two metaphors, the goat, or the ram and the goat, to help us better understand what's happening in this great controversy. And so we, we get some more information in Daniel 8 about the horn, or the horn power. Now the sanctuary was central to the life and to the education and to the worship of the people of Israel. Without a temple, they wondered how they could worship God. You remember when Jesus was talking to the disciples and he talked about the destruction of the temple. And the disciples asked, please clarify, please help us understand, because in their mindset, if the temple is going to be destroyed, that must be the end of the world. And that's what their mindset was. So you can understand why they were so discouraged because their temple was destroyed and they were stranded in Babylon and then later in Medo Persia. Let's look at verse 1 of chapter 8. In the third year of the reign of Belshazzar, a vision appeared unto me, even unto me Daniel, after that which appeared unto me at the first. 
Now remember in Daniel 7, the vision that Daniel receives is in the first year of Belshazzar's rule as king. Chapter 8, two years later, it's in the third year of his rule as king. And Daniel refers to that previous vision. He's referring to the vision of Daniel chapter 7. Notice verse 2. And I saw in a vision, and it came to pass, when I saw that I was in Shusan, in the palace, which is the province of Elim, and I was in vision, and I was by the river of Uli. Verse 3. Then I lifted up my eyes, and saw, and behold, there stood before the river a ram, which had two horns, and the two horns were high, but one was higher than the other, and the higher came up last. Remember the bear from Daniel 7? Remember that one of his shoulders was higher than the other? We see the same metaphor here in, in the ram. It has these two horns, one's higher, but then Daniel says that the, that the latter horn comes up last, comes up to be the primary one. You remember when Belshazzar was having this, this, this um, feast or this party, and the Medes and the Persians invaded from 539 to 522, if you look at the dynasty of the kings of the Medo-Persian empires, they were all Medes, except for Cyrus, who was half Median and half Persian. From 522 to 331, all the kings of the empire, the Medo-Persian empire, are Persians. And it's no longer referred to as the Medo-Persian Empire, it's referred to as the Persian Empire, which today we would call Iran. So Daniel sees these two animals. They show strength, they show leadership. And it says the ram came from the west and charged in, in three different directions. And I suppose one of the reasons God chose a ram illustrate this because remember in the Babylonians in their architecture you saw a lot of lions in the Persians in their architect you saw a lot of rams verse 4 I saw the ram pushing westward and northward and southward so that no beast might stand before him neither was there any that could deliver out of his hand but he did according to his will and became great so Daniel was saying, this, this ram is powerful. He goes west. Remember in, the, in Daniel 7 that the beast had, the bear had three ribs in its mouth. And we learned that that represented Babylon, Lydia, and Egypt. Well, as the ram goes west in its conquest of Babylon, it goes south in its conquest of Lydia, and it goes north in its conquest of Egypt. Verse 5. And I was considering, behold, and a he goat came from the west on the face of the whole earth, and he touched not the ground, and the goat had a notable horn between his eyes. Ever see a flying goat? Well, Daniel did. And it says it came from the west. Where do you think Greece is located when it comes to Persia? It's to the west. And he says, he came to the ram that had two horns, and I was seen standing before the river, and ran unto him in fury of his power. And I saw it attack the ram furiously, striking the ram and shattering its two horns. And the ram was powerless to stand against it. The goat knocked to the ground and trampled on it, and none could rescue the ram from its power. It's interesting for me, it's interesting to read, because I enjoy, I enjoy history, you know, these battles between the, the Greeks and the Persians. And one of these major battles, the Persians brought over a million soldiers to war. And the Greeks, under Alexander the Great, brought 40,000 soldiers. And who do you think won that battle? Yeah, the Greeks won. Daniel says that this, 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 
This goat was phenomenal. As powerful as that ram was, it was powerless against this goat. And when Daniel says that the goat wasn't touching the ground, he was indicating how fast and how swift was his victory. And when you read the history of Alexander the Great, his conquest of the known world was phenomenal. In three years, he conquered what he believed to be the known world. Remember in Daniel 7, this is Daniel 7 verse 6, it describes that third beast as a leopard with four heads and four wings, emphasizing its swiftness, just as Daniel does in chapter 8. Verse 20, verse 20 through 22, Daniel is told who this ram and this goat is. Notice verse 20, it says, The ram which thou sawest, having two horns, are kings of Eden and Persia. 21, And the rough goat is the king of Grecia, and the great horn that is between his eyes is the first king, referring to King Alexander the Great. Verse 22, Now that being broken, whereas four stood up, for it, four kingdoms shall stand up of the nation, but not in his power. In other words, what Daniel was saying, as we know from history, that when Alexander the Great died at the age of 30, 33, and his, king, his generals came to him and said, well, who's going to be the next king? And he said, who's ever the most powerful? And Greece was then divided into four different kingdoms, and out of one of those four kingdoms would come the Roman Empire. So, so far, in chapter 8, Daniel had been given as a history lesson. There was no spiritual warfare being discussed in, in chapter 8 thus far. This is about the war between these two. And if you noticed, Babylon's not mentioned. Now there's a couple of reasons for that. Number one, Babylon is about to come to an end. You remember in chapter 7, excuse me, chapter 5, chapter 6, I'm getting it right. The Medes and Persians marched into the empire and Belshazzar was executed. By the time that Daniel's writing, third year of Belshazzar's rule, a few years later, the Median Persians will destroy, bring to an end the Babylonian Empire. And this prophecy that Diana read to us, read for us, the 2300-day prophecy, doesn't occur in the time of the Babylonians, but in the time of the Persians. Let's go back to verse 8. Therefore the he-goat waxed very great. Now he said that the ram was, was great. When he says the, the goat was very great, and when he was strong, the great horn was broken, and it came up four notable ones toward the four winds of heaven. In other words, in, in, the, in the epics of Alexander the Great's power, he accomplished everything, and then he died. And his nation was divided into four different kingdoms. Verse 9, and out of one of them came forth a little horn. This is a reference to the birth of the iron monarchy of Rome, which waxed exceedingly great toward the south, toward the east, and toward the pleasant land. Pleasant land being Israel. Verse 10, and it waxed great even unto the host of heaven, and it cast down some of the hosts and of the stars to the ground, and it stamped upon them. Verse 11, Yea, he magnified himself even to the prince of hosts, and by him the daily sacrifice was taken away, and the place of his sanctuary was cast out. And the host was given him against the daily sacrifice by reason of transgression, and it cast down the truth to the ground, and it practiced and prospered. Now look in your Bible. But I checked the Pew Bible to make sure 
you see that the word sacrifice is yours italicized? Yes. What does it mean when there's a word italicized? It's added. It doesn't exist. In the Hebrew, that word sacrifice is not there. Now, if you have access, you got a computer, you can Google it, to the Amplified Bible. In verse 9, it tells you, it, it, it um, inserts the name Antioch of Epiphanes. Anybody know who Antioch of Epiphanes is? Anybody not know who Antioch of Epiphanes is? Okay, a couple of you don't know who he is. That's all right. So it, if you're the kind of person who likes to write in your Bible, you can draw a line for the word sacrifice because it doesn't exist in the Hebrew. But it is, for some of the translators, it was inserted because they believe that Antioch's Epiphanes is the one being described here. Now, he was a Syrian king. Not a great king, not a notable king, not one that people would remember. And he did stop the sacrifices in the temple of the Israelites for three years. But if you look at the description that Daniel 7 gives us of who the little horn power is, it's not Antioch the Bithynes. Even though many people would like us to believe that, because there are three major interpretations of Scripture. There is the pederast that, that all prophecy occurred in the past. There is the futurism that is still waiting to happen, which is probably the most popular interpretation. And the historical, which Seventh-day Adventists follow. So to put Antioch's Epiphanes in there would help bolster the position of the pederast, which says the Antichrist has already come. No sweat, nothing to worry about. It's all over. We're good to go. And also, if you like to write in your Bibles, you can circle that word daily, draw a line outside your margin, and write continual without interruption. That's what Daniel is describing. The sanctuary, the ministry of Christ, continual without interruption. Now in, in Daniel 8, as in Daniel 7, we see this little horn power, this anti-Christ power. Remember, we learned that anti doesn't mean a, necessarily mean against. It's not limited to that. But it also means instead of. And so the host was given him against the day of the sacrifice by reason of transgression. And it cast down the truth to the ground and it practiced in hospital. So while God's people are being persecuted, while the word of God is under attack, it says the little horn power prospers through its practice. Doesn't make much sense, does it? You would think that it would be unsuccessful, but God is warning us. He is telling us, don't be shocked. Don't be surprised or caught off guard if you see a lot of deceptions, if you see a lot of traditions find themselves into the teachings. Don't be called off guard. Because this is the work and the ministry of the little horn power. Isaiah 14, verse 13 says, For thou hast said in thine heart, I will ascend to heaven. I will exalt my throne above the stars of God. I will sit also upon the mount of the congregation in the sides of the earth. Who is Isaiah describing? Say it yes. Ultimately, the little horn power is the power of Lucifer working through institutions, working through people. And the little horn power originates from the north. This is why it's, I'm sure that scripture would be. Unlike the, the struggle between the ram and the goat, which was geographical and political, 
the battle against the prince of the host and the little horn power is a spiritual battle of cosmic proportions. It is a universal struggle against God's sanctuary, against God's teachings, against God's ministry, and against Jesus Christ. The first part of Daniel, we're looking horizontal. But once we get past the goat whose horn is broken, the battle goes vertical in the little horn. And the, the Prince of Hosts. Who is the Prince of Hosts? Who'd you say? How do you know that? Because you think so. Because preachers have been telling us so. How do you know it's Jesus? Well, let's hold your place in Daniel 8 and flip to. We're going to look at two scriptures. 1 Samuel 7, 1 Samuel 17, 45. Remember, he threw the, the host of the stars to the ground. Oh, I've got a little head on something, so we'll, we'll back up and then we'll go back forward. Who was cast to the ground? Who? My wife says I'm hard of hearing, so you have to speak up. 1 Samuel 17, 45. Then Daniel said to the Philistine, You come to me with a sword, with a spear, and a javelin, but I come to you in the name of the Lord of hosts, the God of the armies of Israel, whom you have taunted. So when he throws the stars down, who is he throwing down? The armies of God. And who are you and I? We are the armies of God. Lucifer, or, or the, excuse me, the, the little horn power, is trampling upon the stars, the whole, he's trampling upon God's army. He's trying to destroy them. Chapter 7 tells us that, that one of the key principles of the little horn power is to persecute God's people. Verse 11 of Daniel 8. And he magnified himself even to the Prince of Hosts. And when I ask you the question, who is that Prince of Hosts? Flip to Joshua chapter 5 and verse 13. This is not translated the same, but it's the same Hebrew concept that's found in Daniel 8. Daniel, uh, Joshua 5, verse 13. And it came about when Joshua was by Jericho that he lifted up his eyes and looked, and behold, a man was standing opposite him with a sword drawn in his hand. And Joshua went to him and said, Are you for us or for our adversaries? Verse 14, he said, No, rather I indeed come now as captain of the host of the Lord. The prince of hosts, captain of the Lord of hosts, are similar in the Hebrew. Joshua fell on his face to the earth, bowed down and said to him, What has my Lord to say to his servant? And the captain of the Lord's host said to Joshua, Remove your sandals from your feet, for the place where you stand is holy. And Joshua did so. So the captain of the host and the prince of the host are the same person. You reference Jesus Christ. So not only is a little horn power doing war against God's people, he's doing war against Jesus Christ. <clears throat> Let's flip to Exodus 28, verse 30. Hold yourself there in Daniel, but flip to Exodus 28 and verse 30. 
You know, one, I just realized there's no clock up there. I could preach all day. <laughs> okay, Exodus 28, 30. You shall put in the breastplate of judgment the Urim and Thurim, and they shall be over Aaron's heart when he goes in before the Lord. And Aaron shall carry the judgment of the sons of Israel over his heart before the Lord. What does that have next word? Continually. Continually. In the Hebrew, that's that same word for daily. Uninterrupted. That, that Jesus' ministry to us is uninterrupted. Those morning and evening services, the sacrifice of the different animals, was to be continual. Exodus 25, 30, you shall set the bread of presence on the table before me. It says that the showbread was to be there at all times. The candlesticks would be burning continually. Another word that's used is the word perpetual. Exodus 30, verse 8. When Aaron trims the lamps at twilight, he shall burn incense. There shall be perpetual incense before the Lord throughout our generation, throughout your generations. So what the Lord is telling us through his word, and even, even though the Antichrist or the little horn power has declared war against the ministry of Christ by introducing salvation by works and introducing traditions and introducing all kinds of false concepts, all kinds of pagan concepts. The Lord says, Christ's ministry is perpetual. It is without interruption. No matter what the little horn power tries to do. Verse 12 of Daniel 8. And a host was given him against the daily sacrifice by reason of transgression. It cast out the truth to the ground and it practiced and prospered. The church, the little horn power, papal Rome, did not have political power. Excuse me, did not have military power, so it was dependent on that fourth beast. Or as Daniel 2 says, the iron monarchy of Rome to accomplish its purposes. And it, it prospered because it had the army of Rome behind it. Verse 13, Then I heard one saint speak, and another said unto him to a certain saint, which said, How long shall the vision concerning the daily sacrifice, or that would be concerning the daily, and the transgression of desolation, to give both the sanctuary and the host trodden underfoot? Verse 14, and he said unto me, unto 22,300 days, then the sanctuary shall be cleansed. But what do we learn that days mean in prophecy? That days stand for years. So we're talking about 2,300 years. I imagine when Daniel first heard these 2,300 days, he probably thought, well, that's not so bad. Then he remembered, days stand for a year. Verse 15, it says, It came to pass when I, even I, Daniel, had seen the vision and sought for the meaning. Then, behold, there stood before me as the appearance as a man. As I heard a man's voice between the banks of Uli, which called and said, Gabriel, make this man understand the vision. Verse 17, So he came near where I stood. And when he came, I was afraid and fell upon my face. And he said unto me, Understand, son of man, for the time, for at the time of the end shall be the vision. Now as he was speaking with me, I was in deep sleep on my face toward the ground. And he touched me and set me upright. In verse 19, he said, Behold, I make thee know what shall be the last end of the indignation. At the time appointed, it appointed the end shall be. So then the, Dan the angel goes and begins to explain the 2300 days to Daniel. 
In verses 20 through 22, he explains who the, who the ram is and who the goat is. And then verse 24, it says, His power shall be mighty, but not by his own power. Now, this is the power of the little horn, not of the ram and the goat. He shall destroy wonderful, shall prosper, shall practice, and shall destroy the mighty and the holy people. 